to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 15 and 16. If you will remain standing, I just want you to read that verse out loud with me because this is our primary scripture for today. Once again, 1 Corinthians chapter number 4, verse 15 and 16. We're reading from the King James Version of the Bible. And once you have that, would you say amen? Amen. 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 Let us read out loud together. 1 Corinthians 4, 15 says... For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore, I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Today I'm going to use for a subject title, A Real Father. A Real Father. Would you be seated? Paul is the apostle who wrote this to the Corinthian church and in his first letter to the Corinthians, and he is encouraging them to follow him. Why? Because he says that I have begotten you with the gospel. For there are many, many instructors in Christ, but there aren't many fathers. And he wanted to let them understand what fatherhood is all about. And so he says, I'm your father because I have begotten you. The word begot really means to cause something to come forth or to birth out. Oh, yeah. And so with the preaching of the gospel, Paul is saying that you got saved when I preached the gospel to you. On his missionary journeys, Paul would go around to various places, various cities, various countries. And when he would preach to the people, there would be many who would hear the truth. And they would give their life to Jesus Christ and the Lord would place his spirit in the people. And then that is the born again experience. Amen. When the spirit of the Lord comes to live in you, that is called the born again experience. And Paul was saying that, all right, you got many instructors, but I am the one who preached to you when you got born again. So therefore... The same gospel, the same message, the same instruction, and, and the same faith, that's what you should remain in. Amen. Because whatever caused you to come to Christ, that's what's going to keep you in Christ. So, so when you're hearing from many other instructions or instructors, you need to recognize that there is only one true gospel. And if they are preaching on that same foundation, then yes, you can adhere to that. But I want you to follow me, is what Paul was saying. The reason he was saying follow me is because he knew he was following Christ. And as long as he's following Christ, his disciples should follow what he is doing. He would set the example for how to live your life. And so therefore, he's considered the father. Now, Paul had begotten them through the gospel which again means to bring forth or give birth to. It also means to provide seed. You know how this is in a natural birth. A natural father is one who provides the seed. And when the seed is planted, then that seed can grow into what it's supposed to become. And so this is what Paul was saying is that through the gospel, the gospel is a seed that's been planted. And once the seed has been planted, now... It's got to be watered. Now God will give the increase and cause it to grow. Amen. So a spiritual father is much like a natural father. One who plants seed. Yes. And once the seed is planted, it is expected to grow into what it's supposed to become. Amen. Let me help you understand what a spiritual father is. The word father in the Bible means one who instructs in wisdom. Yes. One who leaves a legacy which is an inheritance or a treasure or a reward to someone. And it is when he leaves it to those who he would call his sons. Once again, a father is someone who instructs in wisdom, leaving a legacy to those he will call his sons. Now, you need to understand sonship. Sonship is a bestowed honor. If you are called a son... That is a bestowed honor. The word bestowed means you didn't deserve it. It's because someone wanted to call you son. Amen. 
wanted to bring you up and to teach you. So sonship is a bestowed honor. So you ought to want to be somebody's son. Now, there's a difference between children and sons. Children are birthed or adopted. In the natural sense, they are birthed naturally or adopted. This is also in the spirit. Children can be birthed and children can also be adopted in the spirit. But sons evolve. <laughs> you got that? Children are birthed or adopted, but sons evolve. Now don't get scared of that word evolve or evolution because what that really means is it starts out one way but becomes something better. Amen. You've seen how the caterpillar is moving around, wiggling around on the vine or on, on, on in a tree or whatever. You've seen caterpillars before. Yeah. And most of us will consider a caterpillar a very ugly creature. Yeah. But that caterpillar is not going to always look like that. Amen. He looks forward to the day, I'm sure, that he can roll up inside of a cocoon. And once he gets inside of that cocoon, you can't see what's going on inside of the cocoon. But after a while, he comes out. He's a beautiful butterfly. He's no longer the ugly caterpillar. Amen. Well, this is what we mean by sons evolving. You start off as a child, but then as God works on you, you can become a son. So sons are those who are willing to obey the instructions of one who is wiser than himself. If you are a son, you are willing to obey the instruction of one who is wiser than yourself. We can look at John chapter 1, verse 12. You don't have to turn there if you don't want to. You can, you can write it down and look at it later. But here in John 1, 12, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he, being Jesus, power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Wow, look at that. He says, but as many as what? Receive him. To them gave he power to become sons of God. The word power here, you can use the word potential instead of power. Power does mean authority. Power does mean ability. But it also means potential. Everybody say potential. potential. So if you receive Christ, you now have the potential to become a son. So as soon as you get born again, you are a child of God. You're ready to go to heaven. You have the benefits of being a child of God. But understand, you can become something better. You need to be a son. And so God gives you the power, the ability to become sons. Because sons have a position of responsibility that the children don't have. Are y'all here today? And while you are a child of God, God wants to groom you to become a son so that you can then take on the responsibilities that he wants to give to you. Amen. Now, you might be thinking, well, I'm a female. How, how can I be a son? Well, you have to understand something about the scriptures and about the spirit realm. Because, see, once you are operating in the spirit, there is no such thing as male or female. There is no such thing as Jew or Gentile. There's no such thing as black man, white man. Everybody is the same in the sight of God. Everybody has the same potential and the same abilities. When God gives it to you, he gives you the same thing he'll give the other person. And that's the reason why he said it's got nothing to do with gender. Sonship has nothing to do with gender. Sonship has to do with your position in God. Come on, somebody. So you can have a position of sonship. And so when you become a child of God, he positions you to be prepared to become more mature. Because a child is the immature one and the son is the mature one. So he gives you the potential to become sons of God. Let me show you something else about sonship. In Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 17, it says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Amen. So to be a son of God, this is what distinguishes the son from the children. The sons are those who are led by the Spirit. Yeah. 
So when you are a child of God, God wants to teach you how to be led by the Spirit. And when you learn to be led by the Spirit, then you are a son of God. When you, when you come to that place of maturity. But let's look at the rest of this. It says, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption. Whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may be glorified also together. So now, what is he saying to us? He's saying that, yes, when you get born again of the Spirit of God, you become a child, and the Spirit of God gives witness. Now, understand, you, some of you are looking at this and saying, well, they, they wrote the Spirit itself. It should be himself. you got to understand something about the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is both a verb and a noun. Amen. When it is referring to him as a noun, it will say him. But now it is referring to the Spirit as the verb, the action word, yes. meaning that in his actions, in his, in his workings, we can say it's the working of God's Spirit that gives us the confirmation that we are the children of God. Amen. It's the working of the Spirit is what he's talking about. He's putting the emphasis on the work of the Spirit and not the person of the Spirit. Yes, we know the Spirit is the person of God, but then when it says it... When the Bible uses the term itself, referring to the Spirit of God, it's talking about the action or the operation of the Spirit of God. Do y'all get that? So then he says, and then this operation of the Spirit of God, he will then confirm within you that you are a child of God. You just know that you know that you know that you belong to it. Nobody can tell you anything about that. You know for yourself that you have passed from death unto life because you love the brethren. You know for yourself that you're not the same as you used to be. You see the change in you because when you repent of your sins, there will be change. Come on, somebody. And I'm talking about true, genuine repentance. So if you are a child of God, you got you an heir of God. And you are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. That means that everything that belongs to Jesus belongs to you. Everything that God has given to Christ belongs to you. Yeah. And so you are a child of God. That's a good thing. Everybody say it's a good thing to be a child of God. But it's even a better thing to be a son of God. Why? Because here on this earth, you are needed to become sons. Because the whole world and all of creation is waiting the manifestation of the sons of God. Because it's the sons of God who recognize that they have authority in the earth. It's the sons of God who know that they can operate with the power of God to change situations. It's the mature sons of God who can destroy yokes and lift burdens. You are anointed of God to operate in this earth to cast out devils. Amen. So, so, so children, children are usually those who are, uh, oh, I'm so glad I'm a child of God. Yeah, that's good. You're going to heaven. You're a child of God. But, 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 but Lord, bless me. And usually that's the way the prayers go. Bless me with this and give me that and do this for me and do that for me and, and take care of me, oh, Lord, oh, Lord, take care of me. But if you're a son of God, you're going around take, making a difference somewhere, making a difference in other people's lives. You're the one that's going, r r laying hands on the sick, and the sick will recover. You're the ones that's going out here uh, casting out devils. You're the ones that's going out here destroying yokes and lifting burdens. You're the ones that's going out here doing the works of the kingdom of God. Those are the mature ones, and that's who the world is waiting for. Become a mature son of God. Because the Father has empowered you Amen. to do what he does. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. So it's good to be a child, but you've got to evolve into a son. Amen. Hello, somebody. Amen. Proverbs 13, 22. It tells us here, a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. So now we have to understand, because uh, I, I for years read and, and listened to messages about uh, how that the, a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Say, my goodness, that's another generation right there. 
Does that mean I, I, all, all good men are people who are rich and, and, and very well off and they got to store up and have enough uh, money and enough uh, land and property to pass down to their grandchildren? And so I said, well, the, you know, many of us are going to fall short of, of being a good man, Lord. But then he showed me this, what this is really saying. He says a good man leaves an inheritance Wait, wait, wait a minute. What is the inheritance that he wants the good man to leave? The inheritance that he wants the good man to leave is wisdom. Amen. Wisdom. Why? Because wisdom is something you can teach to someone. You, you, you teach them how to do things. A, 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 a good man, a, a father, likes to take his sons and teach them things and, and show them the ways of life so that he'll be able to survive in this world. And so when you, when you have wisdom that you can pass down to another generation, you can pass that same wisdom down to several generations. And those sons that you raise up, they can carry that on to another generation. Why? Because Wisdom is more important than the riches. Why? Because with wisdom, God gives you the power to get wealth. Amen. Oh, oh, many of you have heard the expression, uh, you know, you, you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. But if you teach him how to fish, he can eat for a lifetime. Amen. It's more important to teach him how to fish than it is to just give him stuff. Amen. There are some people in this world right now who feel like they are entitled to things. That you're just supposed to just give them stuff. And, and they're going to live off of you. But see, what a good man does is he leaves wisdom. He leaves an inheritance to teach them this is how you're supposed to carry on in life. This yeah. is going to help you to make it through life. and So that you will be able to help and provide for somebody else. It's not all about you just making yourself happy. But learn how to do something. Come on, are you here today? A good man, a good father, a real father is trying to teach somebody something. Amen. So it's the teaching responsibility that is on a father. Why? Because we get that from our heavenly father. Amen. So words are powerful. Words are more powerful than just you giving stuff. Isaac knew that. Many of you knew the story about how that Jacob tricked his father Isaac after his father had become an old man and he had become blind and Jacob had a twin brother named Esau. Esau was the oldest of the two sons. And so Jacob was a trickster. And Jacob allowed his mother actually to work alone, you know, and, and they, were, they were going to trick uh, their father or his father out of the blessing that actually belonged to Esau, yeah. the oldest son. Yeah. See, the oldest son was the one who would, receive most of the inheritance. The oldest son is the one who would receive the position of leadership in the family. After the father would pass on, then the oldest son in the family would take on the responsibilities that the father once had. Amen. And so the oldest son usually would be the one who would take on, uh, he would get the uh, inherit the property. He would have most of the land. He would have most of the, the finances and everything. So most everything would go to him. But the honor was mainly on the oldest son because he was going to take the position of authority in the family. And he would lead the family. Well, Jacob tricked his father out of giving him the blessing. He tricked first Esau so that Esau would give him his birthright. The birthright, of course, is that inheritance. And so <laughs> when, when, when Esau got hungry enough, he came home after a hunt, and he saw that his brother Jacob was fixing some stew. And he wanted that stew. And Jacob said, if you let me have your birthright, I'll let you have this stew. And Esau literally despised his birthright at that point. He said, I don't care about that. I'm hungry right now. I mean, if you know that there are a lot of people who are more concerned about their right now than their future. And so he wanted to satisfy his, his urge for that moment. He wanted to satisfy his, his craving for that moment. And so he wanted to eat that stew. And he said, I, you know, forget that birthright stuff. You can have it. Jacob then got the birthright through that, through, through that trickery. Then he also came to his father Isaac when his father was sick and his father had gone blind. And he came in disguised as Esau. He had, Esau was hairy, so he put on hair uh, all over his arms, and he, he was all disguised like that. So he smelled like Esau. He, 
he, he, he felt like Esau. His father heard his voice and said, you sound like Jacob, but you, you, you feel like and you smell like Esau. And he said, I am Esau. So he comes in there and he said, now I'm going to give you the blessing. He spoke a blessing on Jacob, thinking that he was speaking the blessing on Esau. And when he spoke the blessing, what did he say? He basically was telling him he was going to cause his enemies to be, uh, to be chased off, that he was going to have certain land, and that the people of the world were going to eventually bow down to his descendants. And, and all of his, the, the, those who would be descendants of his son, he said, the, the world is going to look upon you and, and literally bow down to you, and the nations of the world will, will give you recognition. And so he did all of this with his voice. When, he, when Jacob left out, Esau came in immediately. And he said, Father, I'm ready for you to bless me. I'm giving you this food, so you eat this and, and, and bless me. And he said, I've already blessed you. He said, oh, oh, well, who was that that came in here? He, he said, that had to have been your brother Jacob. Now, I would have thought that since he only used words to bless him, that all he had to do was just change his words and say, no, it won't be for him, it's going to be for you. But it couldn't be that way. Because Isaac recognized the position of a father. Amen. The position of the father can speak destiny to his children. Amen. And so he was in that place where he could speak destiny to his son. So whenever he spoke something, he realized that his words are tangible. Amen. How many of you realize your words are tangible? That's why we, ha we have to give account to every idle word we speak. And all the things that we say, it's, 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 it, it causes things to, to materialize. Amen. That's why the Bible tells us that faith is the substance. Everybody say substance. substance. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Why? Yes. Because when you use faith, faith causes those things that don't exist to materialize. Amen. And so, therefore, he realized that his words were just as powerful as if he had taken the actual thing and handed it to him. Amen. All he had to do was speak it. And so he said, son, I have no more blessing to give you. I gave everything to the other one. I gave it all to, 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 to Jacob. And Esau screamed and cried because he said, father, is there not anything left for me? He said, I'm so sorry. I already spoke it out. And it went to him. So he couldn't take his words back because he knew that the Amen. words that he spoke were powerful and tangible. Yes. How many of you realize that death and life is in the power of the tongue? Amen. And we have to be cautious of what we're saying. We have to make sure we mean what we're saying. Amen. That's why a man's words are weighed much in the spirit. Amen. Come on now. Amen. All right. Sons. Sons. This is another difference between sons and children. Listen to this. Sons are trusted with responsibilities. They are mature enough to make decisions. Amen. Whereas children are not trusted with responsibilities and they need others to decide for them. See, if you have been trusted as a son, you now have the authority to make decisions. You come to a place of maturity in your life where you are now trusted with responsibility and you can make decisions yourself. Amen. Whereas as a child, somebody else is always deciding for you. Amen. Decide where you go, when you get up, where you, what, what you're going to wear and, and all of these things. But when you become a son, you start taking on responsibilities and making decisions. Now, if you are trusted to make decisions, that means that you have free will. And when you got free will, now you are supposed to draw from the things that you have been taught up to that point. If you have been taught the right thing, you are supposed to make decisions based on what you've been taught. And so you now see it uh, over here, bad decision. Over here, right decision. And you are faced with decisions every day. If you're a good son, you're going to always make the right decision, the right choices. And you're going to have the intention of making the right choices. Amen. But guess what? Just because you're a son, you might sometimes make mistakes. You might sometimes make the wrong choices. Amen. But it is your choice. Yes. And then you have been given that responsibility. And see, whatever you have been taught, it is meant for you 
to handle it the right way. So now the Father releases you to, to make decisions. That's when you become a son. When the Father releases you to make decisions. He's already taught you now. And now you have to decide where you are today. Are you a son or are you a child? Because if you're a child, you need somebody else to make the decisions for you. You cannot, you cannot take responsibility or your responsibilities are very small. But when you make right decisions and do the right thing and, and, and take on the teaching that the Father gave you, you'll be blessed with more responsibility. For whom much is given, much is required. Many of you are familiar with the story of the prodigal son over in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 15, where Jesus gives this parable about the man who had two sons, and both of them really wanted to get their inheritance, but the, the, the younger son wanted to take his right then. He wanted every, well, everything that's coming to him. He was ready for it right then, he said. But his father decided, okay, you feel like you're ready? I'm going to give it to both of you. And so he gave both of them their, their inheritance right then. Well, the younger son, as you know, he went off into a, a far country. And all he did was squander it and he spent and he, and he used it on, on, on riotous living with prostitutes and drinking and, and smoking and gambling and, and, and just, just partying. And that's all he wanted to do. So he wasted all the money that his father had given to him. And after he had wasted all the money his father had given to him, there came a great famine in the land. Yeah. There came a time when hardships hit everybody. Everybody was unemployed. All the people were, were, were scratching and scraping and wondering, what are we going to do? So the, like the economy problems now that we're having with coronavirus, people are wondering, what are we going to do? Well, if you were wise, then you would have something. But what's happened, this, this boy had spent everything. And the famine came. And he, he didn't know what to do with himself because all of his friends had left him. As long as he had something, he had quote-unquote friends because they were all just going to live off of him. But when he spent up everything he had, all his friends were gone. He was left alone to fend for himself. Yeah. What about all those teachings that his father had given to him? He threw all of that away too. And he ended up getting a job at, at feeding hogs. Somebody said, just come out here. We, you know, we, we, we'll let you have a, a job feeding the hogs. Well, well, well how, you, how much are you going to pay me? Well, you know, pay is, is real hard to come by now. His money is hard to come by. So uh, your pay would just be to eat the hog slop. So you have, you, you have something to eat. So, so, so the boy was down there, and he, he started desiring the food that the hogs was eating because things were so bad. And when he realized, the Bible says he came to himself. I'd be doing better in my father's house if I just go back and be one of his servants. I'll go back and be a slave in my father's house rather than to be out here eating hog food and moving around wallowing in the mud with the pigs. He came to himself when times got really, really hard. And for some people, it has to be that way. They don't really learn anything until times get really hard when nobody else can reach in and help them. Yeah. Wherever they turn, they say, help me, help me, help me, and nobody's there to help them. They got to get to the place to where they come to themselves, and he realized, I'm supposed to be at my father's house. I'm just going to go back and just see if he'll just take me on as one of his slaves. So he gets back on the journey back to his father's house. And the father, what was he doing? As a real father would, he was always concerned about him. He always wondered what, what happened to that boy. He could be dead because times have gotten so hard. We're hearing about killings everywhere. We're hearing about abductions everywhere. Things are going on all around us. Uh, and riots are going on here and there. I don't know where he is. Yeah. I still love my son even though he did wrong. Yes, Lord. I still love him. I wonder where he is. Well, he happened to be looking down the road one day. And here comes from a long distance, some raggedy looking person, clothes hanging off of him, hair all messed up, all dirty. He could smell him a mile away. Tell the Lord, what is that? Yeah. Then when he saw 
and looked close enough and said, that's my son. That's my son. Yeah. He runs to meet him. And when he runs to meet him, he embraces him. He calls upon someone to go get a robe and put it around him. Go kill the fatty calf. We're going to have a party. Get my ring and put it on his head. We're going to have a celebration Amen. because my son, who I thought was dead, has Amen. now come back home to me. Amen. What a father. What a father. Though he had much right there with him, that one that got away was still on his heart. The son was probably looking at him like, oh, Father, I, I don't deserve this. I, I am, I'm not worthy to be called your son. He said, you are not the one that can say whether you're worthy or not. I'm the one who can say whether you're worthy or not. I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you did. I know you've messed your life up. I know you've destroyed everything I gave you. But I want you to know one thing. I still love you. Amen. And I'm going to have a celebration just because you came home. You made bad decisions, but God welcomes you. You messed up everything that God gave you, but God welcomes you. Hallelujah. But when this boy comes home and they have a celebration, what about his other son? His other son shows up and he's angry. And when he tells him, you never killed a fatty calf for me. You never put a ring on my hand. You never put a robe on me. You never did any of this stuff for me. And the father had to rebuke him. He said, boy, you've been here all along. I gave you your, your, your money, but you're still living off of me. <laughs> I still provide the meals that you eat. I still provide your income and your, and your employment. I still have the bed that you're sleeping on. That's my bed. Everything that's here is mine, but I'm letting you have it. You're living in the lap of luxury. What are you saying? But this, your brother, he was dead, but now alive again. You need to come in here and celebrate what's going on with somebody else who had lost everything, who had been mistreated, and, and who had done the wrong thing, and now he's come back. You need to be in here celebrating with us instead of being so selfish. I mean, if you realize that sometimes people can be so blessed, they got all their blessing, but they forget about God, and they forget about where it came from. They forget about it, what everything you've got was given to you. Oh, my goodness, there are many children of God that's like that. And I say children because, see, that's not the mature one. He's not a mature one. Neither one of these were acting out of maturity. But this is, this is just a, a, an example of immature children. But the father gave them both the opportunity to become sons. Amen. And now they got an opportunity to grow up. Amen. This scenario was presented to them so that they can now start to grow up and mature. Amen. You see how the father is there to support you no matter what. Yeah. But you got everything that you need right in the father's house. Amen. And if you run off to try to do something else on your own, all you're going to do is mess up. Amen. You got to declare if you're a father today that as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. My children may not be acting right right now, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. This is holy ground. And any time you come in here, you better know that you can feel the presence of God in this place. Somebody ought to give the Lord a praise. As we wrap this thing up, we're talking about real fathers. Real fathers never give up. Real fathers never give up hope because even if their children look like they'll never be anything, the real fathers still have hope. You can become. You can achieve. You can make it. You might have failed this time, but I know that as long as you got breath in your body, there's still an opportunity for you to achieve. There's still an opportunity for you to get it better, to, to make it better and to make it right. There is still hope for you. Real fathers never give up. That man continued to look down the road and to see if his son would ever come home. And finally his son came home. Why? Because he was a praying man. Real fathers allow room for mistakes for the sake of teaching. Their sons are going to make some mistakes. We as sons of God. As we are listening and learning how to be led of the Spirit, sometimes we'll make mistakes. 
Sometimes we'll think God was saying something when it wasn't God. Sometimes we will uh, fall into some, some, some places that, uh, that, 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 that get us where we're confused and, and going down the wrong direction. But what does the Father do? The Father chastises us. Yes. Why? Because chastisement is love. Yes. Chastisement does not feel good. But chastisement is discipline to get you back on track. See, he's not just punishing you just because you did wrong. But what he's doing is he is trying to put you right back in place. Amen. Our Heavenly Father is a little bit different from some of our fathers. I used to get whippings from my granddaddy. He was the disciplinarian in our family. I mean, all the cousins and children and nieces and nephews, everybody got whipped by my granddaddy. We called him Papa. He wasn't no bigger than a net, but he had those big old shoes. He wore those big boots, and you can hear his boots walking on, those, on that wooden floor. And it sounded like a giant was coming around the corner. And if you had done anything wrong, you, you, you get nervous and sweating and everything. Because what they do is have all the children to line up on the couch. Just sit on the couch and wait for Papa to come in. And we heard him coming. Boom, boom, boom. You would think a huge man was coming around the corner. But he'd come around the corner in those big old boots. And then he had that long switch in his hand where most of us didn't get a whipping with a switch. He would use things like fan belts and stuff. And all the kids sitting on the couch just shaking. <laughs> oh, oh, please, please don't whip me, Papa. Oh, please don't. And Papa would grab us one at a time. <laughs> and then he start beating, whap, 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 whap. And, and the thing about it is, he talked to you while he's whipping you. <laughs> Telling you, why you shouldn't have done that? What you do that for? Why did you? It always got real bad when he started stuttering. Didn't I, didn't I, didn't I tell you not to, not to do it? No, no, huh, 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 huh. I'm like, God. <laughs> that whipping didn't seem like it was going to ever get over. <laughs> Woo. What, what, what a memory that came back right there. <laughs> but guess what? He loved us. <laughs> that was just the way they did discipline then. Y'all better be glad it ain't quite like that. Some, some of y'all have some things going on. I mean, you know, but that was not abuse. You can whip your children and it won't be abuse because the Bible says spare not the ride. If you spare the ride, you'll spoil the child. Don't worry about them crying because you're beating demons out of them. Come on now. They'll get straightened out. Amen. Some of them need more spankings than others. But the Bible teaches that this kind of, this kind of discipline is necessary. Because what are you doing? You're driving out the devil. I, I was supposed to be closing. Real fathers, forgive. But they warn you about the consequences that remain. And you realize that you can do something wrong. And there will still be some consequences to come. Amen. You might be forgiven, but the consequences are still remaining. Amen. Real fathers will remind you, all right, you, you messed up. I forgive you for what you did. But don't think that you're not going to reap what you sowed. You're still going to have to pay for this in some way or another. It's still going to come back because there are all, there's always an effect. There's a cause, and then there's an effect. Amen? Amen. So there's... This is the result of your free will. You made the decision, and now this is the consequence of your free will decision. Finally, real fathers continue to point the way to Jesus Christ, our Heavenly Father. Amen. You see, you can't do anything without the Heavenly Father. I remember when I was uh, a new dad, and I'm rocking the baby in my arms, and I was sitting in my, in my recliner, getting ready to feed the baby at 3 a.m. And I said, Lord, what do I do with this? And God showed me what to do. He said, just love him. And I said, oh, okay, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. And so the love was in my heart. So when you operate under love and let love be your motivator, you're not going to, you're not going to mess up. You might make some mistakes. But God always line you right back up. But along the line, you are not going to ruin this relationship. And you're not going to ruin what God has given to you to do because you are motivated by love. Amen. And if you're motivated by love, you won't 
destroy what God has given to you. Amen. In Ephesians 6, 4, it says, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. This is our duty. As fathers, that is, is to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Point them the way to Jesus Christ. Amen. If there's no greater word of wisdom that you can give, and there is no greater word of wisdom, then you draw them to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Amen. Because he is our heavenly father. Yes, he is. And he is the true father. Yes. He is a real father. Amen. The devil tries to be your father, but he, he got you illegitimately <laughs> by trickery in the Garden of Eden. Yes. But Jesus got us legitimately Amen. by shedding his blood on Calvary. Amen. And brought us back into relationship with the Heavenly Father. Amen. So once again, as many as will receive Jesus Christ, Amen. he gives you the power to become sons of God. Hallelujah. And when he gives you the power to become sons of God, he expects you to occupy in this earth Hallelujah. until he returns. You take the place of Jesus in Hallelujah. this world. You take the place of Jesus. So when you pray, you pray in the name of Jesus and everything that God has promised to Jesus Christ, the seed of Abraham, it belongs to you because you also are the seed of Abraham. Somebody ought to give him a praise offering right there. Abraham being the father of our faith. Jesus Christ made the covenant to bring us into the faith. Paul the Apostle to the Gentiles wrote the letters that will help us understand how this thing happens yes. and show us what it is that we're supposed to do. And as long as we love the Lord, yes. he's loving us yes. because he had to love us first and put the love in our heart. And when you're drawn to him, the power of God is in you so that you can do exploits in the spirit, in the earth. Our real father is God. Doesn't matter what kind of relationship you've had with your biological father. Maybe you didn't have a right relationship or a good relationship with your right, with your heavenly, or rather your uh, earthly father. But your heavenly father's been with you all along. Amen. Let him be your real father. Amen. And that's why Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. Yes. If you follow the word of God, you got wisdom to live the life you're supposed to live. Oh, yes. Now take that wisdom and pass it on to somebody else. And Amen. you will become a father, a real father. Whether you're male or whether you're female, Amen. you still have the power to pass on that inheritance, the word of God, Amen. to another generation. Let's do that in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you right now for this word. And we thank you that you've made us sons. Sons of God by inheritance. That we can walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, Lord. That we can move by the power of God. Yes, Lord. That we can have the ability to affect and change the world around us. Yes, Lord. Lord God, with all the confusion that's going on in this world, Lord, we need you. Yes. You are the answer. Yes, Lord. We, we, black lives matter. All lives matter. Newborn babies matter. Unborn babies matter. Every life you show matters. Because you're not looking at what color anybody is. We're just people in your sight. And the Bible says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So I thank you that you've made a way for us to escape confusions and that's going on in the world. We can't fix racism. Yes, the devil's children are racist. But the devil's children have all kinds of issues because of sin. But once we come out of sin and come into the marvelous light, we are free. We are free. People can call us all kinds of names, but we know who we are. <laughs> it matters what you say about us not what people call us. Now, Lord, I know you'll protect us from the corruption in the world. But we know that we are in a corrupt, toxic world. 
Father, we know that we're not going to make it all beautiful in this time, but the world around us, we can make a difference in some way or another because you've given us the power to do so. But one day we know that the whole world, you said, belongs to those who are in Christ. For you said that by inheritance, the meek shall inherit the earth. And in that earth, there would be no more riots. There would be no more confusion, no more racism, no more fears, no more death. But eternal life is everlasting life with you. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And the kingdom come and your will be done now in earth as it is in heaven. And we give over to you right now. We surrender to you right now. If you have not surrendered your life wholly to the Lord yet, make this be your moment to surrender everything to him right now. And you can just repeat a prayer after me and just say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me, a sinner. Create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit in me. For I believe in my heart and I confess with my mouth that Jesus Christ is my Lord. And from now on, I'll live a holy life as you enable me to, Lord. Thank you for the blessing of your spirit and the eternal life. It belongs to me now. And I'm gl glad about it. Amen. I'm glad about it and I rejoice now in Jesus' name because I'm in the family of God. Welcome to the family of God if you prayed that prayer sincerely. And we thank and praise God for you today as you remain standing. We thank God for you. We love you. We hope that you will get copies of these messages because they'll bless you. And at this time, we're going to bless the food and we're going to have a little time of fellowship.